This is about um, something called Bangle.js. It's a smartwatch that you can program in JavaScript, um, and I did a Kickstarter for it towards the end of last year, uh, as well as having about 400 them go out to um, NodeConf in, in Ireland last year. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bit different in that a lot of the talks I do are very much about JavaScript, and this is about the process of trying to get JavaScript running on something like this. Um, and it, in a way, it fits quite well with what Alistair was saying in the last talk, um, that so much stuff now is dependent on online services, and you, know, you buy it, and it's very much a disposable I item. Um, and especially if you're trying to buy something from a startup, there's always a question of how long is this actually going to hang around. Even if the startup does well, they may get bought up and the owning company may just shut down the things. So this is kind of an antidote to that. Everything is designed such that all of the code is open, free. It's not dependent on any third-party services. Um, and so it's basically me and a few contributors working on stuff like this, which means that we don't have a massive R&D budget. So to get something that's waterproof and that you can actually wear on your wrist and is usable, you really need to lean on other people's hardware. Um, and that's kind of the, the bulk of this talk. So why would you want one of these? Well, um, suppose you, um, you have some hobby like sailing or flying or orienteering or a whole bunch of stuff that um, you want something a little bit unique. You want maybe data displayed in a certain way. Um, you know, maybe you want your, um, your current GPS coordinates displayed as a OS map coordinates. Uh, or maybe you want to record your data in a certain way, merge your, your location and heart rate with other data, like your, your cycling computer. Often, there may be um, devices out there that will do it, but they're probably single use. They're probably rubbish at doing other stuff. Um, and you know, the more niche you get, the more expensive things get, and the more unpolished they get. So this is really a hope of trying to allow people to develop things that really suit them, um, and then put them online in a way that everyone can use them really easily. So if you're going to make your own hardware, you can do things like this. Um, this guy's made his own little, little watch with a, with a display that you can, you can just get off eBay and a bunch of other stuff. And it's quite fun, um, but realistically, it's not adding a bunch of utility to your life. In fact, it's probably going to make your life way harder. It's not waterproof. Um, it's not going to do a bunch of stuff. So you really need to go, um, you know, you, you want a proper molded case, um, probably some kind of touch screen, proper buttons, stuff like that. So you can go for commercial stuff, maybe. Um, but in a lot of cases, this is very locked down. And it's also going to be dependent on other people's services. Um, so. The technology in something like an Apple Watch will be completely cutting edge, and you really have no hope of, um, of reverse engineering it or, um, or, in, or doing anything that Apple didn't intend you to do with it. On the other end of it, you can have some cheaper Android watches, and you may well get some stuff done with that. But um, you're looking at quite low battery lives, quite expensive watches, and um, if you actually if you do something wrong, it's a very expensive mistake. So um, there are actually a whole bunch of really, really cheap watches that you can get hold of. Um, and they, the hardware is kind of OK. It's not amazing, but, um, but actually it's a reasonably high standard. But the problem is the software is often absolutely rubbish. So these are like a really, um, really good thing to, where you could actually add some value by changing the software. Um, they come in a whole bunch of different types. Um, you've got some that actually uh, run Android. Some of these use a chipset called, um, made by a company called MediaTek, and they're basically feature phone chipsets. So um, they're, they're just about capable of, of running like a, a proper OS. But again, reverse engineering these is going to be quite difficult. There's an awful lot of stuff going on, and everything's at quite a high level. You've also got very low-end stuff, which uses um, Chinese chipsets by people called like um, Hunter Sun, I think it is. And they are, unless you can speak Chinese, um, you, they're completely out of reach. All the data sheets are sort of um, Chinese language. And then sitting right in the middle, you've got um, chips by someone called Nordic Semiconductor. And these are really, really good. Um, they've got an ARM Cortex M4 in. They're not super fast. They're 64 megahertz, but they're really very low power. Um, and the nice thing is that 
especially this MRF52832, Nordic only basically make one of these chips. So you can use a development board or you, it, whichever watch you get that uses one of these chips will basically run the same code. And all you really have to care about is how to connect the display up, how to do the buttons and all of that stuff. The actual Bluetooth side of things, once you've got it working on one chip, it'll, it'll work on all of them. Um, because there are microcontrollers, when you open them up, um, often they've got something like this, which is a, um, it's called a, well, it's a debugging port, but the, um, the kind of the pins are something called SWD. So you only need two connections for SWD and then to connect ground. And once you've got that, you can start writing your code directly to the watch. So um, the sad thing is that in a lot of cases, you have to open the watch. Many of these things are designed to be disposable effectively, and they're glued shut, which means that you basically destroy waterproofing by getting into them. Um, so ideally, you would, you would find a way to once you'd maybe done your development watch of getting another one and writing the software to it wirelessly. And you wouldn't think that the company would let you just wirelessly update the firmware to whatever you want. But actually, they do. Um, so when the Nordic chips were first released, they were shipped with a, uh, a SDK, which had a kind of proof of concept bootloader in. And everyone basically just used this bootloader as is. Um, so there was no check to see whether it was actually the right firmware for the device. There was, um, there was not even a check to make sure that um, you were allowed to access a device. So for instance, anyone who's wearing one of these cheap fitness bands, you could run the firmware update code right now and overwrite their firmware. Um, so again, this is, this is a really good reason why you want to replace the firmware on these devices. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated than this because the bootload is broken, but you can still wirelessly update firmware on a lot of these devices. Um, so, I really wanted to try and do a device with GPS because it's, it's just hard to get a sort of a low power GPS tracker or any kind of device that you can program yourself. So it kind of fills a nice niche. And that basically limits um, the amount of watches you've got to about five. Um, and this was the one I ended up using in the end. Um, so it does GPS, Baidu, and Glonus as well. Um, and it's a little bit chunkier than, um, than a lot of other watches you might hope for, but actually having the ability to, um, to get that real-time location can be really handy. It's got um, a reasonably big screen, accelerometer, compass, um, and a big flash tip, which is kind of quite important because um, the chip itself only comes with half a megabyte of flash, which gets used up quite quickly when you start um, using all the Bluetooth functionality in it. Um, the four mega flash gives you a lot of data available to store your applications and everything else. The slightly worrying thing is that um, this 240 by 240 16 bit screen is actually, um, it uses 120 bytes of RAM as a buffer. There's, there's over twice as much RAM inside the screen as there is in the processor. So um, it requires a bit of thought in making that available in a nice, fast way that doesn't use up all your available storage space. So um, I should say, that's a bit slow. Um, these are not the first watches. It's not the first watch I came across. Um, this is a small selection of watches from my um, watch graveyard of various things that have been taken apart and, and looked inside. Um, and the, the biggest problem with a lot of these is not the hardware. Um, in fact, the hardware, you could run Esprino on pretty much all of them. Um, it's to do with the, um, the manufacturer. Most manufacturers tend to get quite scared. If, I mean, because again, there's a language barrier thing. Um, you can, Often it's very difficult to explain what you want to do. And if they do understand what you want to do, often they're quite scared of the idea and they don't want to get involved at all. So, um, so again, you, you're a little bit limited. But anyway, once you've found the watch, um, this one's quite nice in that when you open it up, you've got this really nice little, little puck, basically. Um, there's a screen on top, a little GPS aerial at the back. You can see a little flex BCB working around the corner. Um, and you can see on the back, um, the, the, the Flex PCB goes all the way around. And you've got some buttons on it and a heart rate monitor um, and a speaker and a bunch of other stuff. So you can actually, you can start to peel it off. You can unravel it 
and you can spread it out. And this is not something you know, um, that you would do with your watch. It's something that uh, effectively we do so that, so that no one else has to. Um, but as is, this watch, um, you've got the green circuit board with the actual the guts that does stuff um, and the, the battery and then the backside of the LCD. And this whole thing still works when it's completely unraveled. Um, so it's, it's quite handy to be able to look around. So at this point, to figure out really how it works, we actually have to look at the underlying hardware. Um, so, I mean, given a bunch of you have soldering irons, um, you know what this is about, but as a quick um, aside, uh, this is sort of a very low level circuit board that you know, people might have been producing 30 years ago, I guess. Um, you've got a, a glass fiber sheet, there's copper on, the, um, on one side of it, and that copper acts as wires. And you basically poke components through the holes, you solder them up with what's effectively molten lead, um, and then that makes the connections for you and holds everything in place. But this is a rubbish way of making compact electronics. Not only is it very big, but it's very, um, it takes an awful lot of time and manual labor to get this stuff working. Because often the, you can't quite see the chip, but there's a really big chip with the two rows of pins there. That will require you to sort of manually fiddle the pins to get into the holes. It's not something a machine can do very easily. Instead, um, everyone's moved to surface mount. So what you do is you take the same basic circuit board. Um, this one's got this green solder resist layer on, which effectively stops the solder from moving out too much. Uh, and then you silk screen the solder paste, which are like sort of microscopic blobs of solder, um, into the locations where you want things. And then you have a machine that just pushes all the components into place. And you put it in a big oven. It cooks it about, at about 200 degrees C. All the solder melts, and it, it makes the connections. And this lets you get everything a little bit smaller. Um, and this is actually a reasonably approachable um, circuit to look at and figure out what's happening. Because it's got two layers. It's got one layer on the top, one layer on the bottom. But they're all completely human visible. In fact, you can take all the components off, sand back the little layer of solder resist, and figure out exactly where all the wires go. At this point, you could even scan this in and send it off and get a complete clone of the circuit made, um, and you could assemble your own. But um, you know, people want to get things even smaller. Um, this is a, a Raspberry Pi, um, quite an early one, actually, I think. Um, this, the circuit almost looks simpler than the first one, but there's an awful lot more going on. Um, this chip is a ball grid array chip. Um, so instead of having the visible legs along the, the edge, um, you've got a whole bunch of pads on the bottom of it covered in balls of solder. And the machine puts that down on the board um, and then goes through an oven and it melts on. The issue then is that you've got all of these pins and you can't get the connections out. So um, they don't just use two layers. They use multiple layers of boards sandwiched inside. Um, I forget how many the Raspberry Pi is. I think it might be sort of six layers or so, but they can go all the way up to 12 individual layers of copper um, right inside the board. And at this point, it becomes um, a complete nightmare to figure out what's actually going on. So um, for, for our watch, um, this is actually, uh, it's a four layer board, but it has the old style surface mount chips. So you can still see all the connections around the edge. Uh, and in fact, um, you can often look at, the, um, look at the board, read the numbers on the chips, Google them, get a data sheet, and it will tell you what all the pins are. So on this one, I've actually, you can hardly see it because it's in yellow, but I've, I've kind of drawn the, um, I've tried to label all the pins. Um, and we can kind of work through this. So if we're interested in where the SWD pin goes, you can actually, um, it's just over, it's one of these, um, but you can see they go to these little holes here, and this is kind of the mirror side of the back of the board, and you can look them up there, and then you can follow them around, and you can figure out that they, they, they go to here and here. But something like this pin, this just goes through, and you find like a single dot there, and nothing's, nothing's happening at all. So it's, um, that means it's a four-layer board, though that goes to a wire that is hidden somewhere inside, and we have no idea where it's going. Um, so we can get a few things, figure out where the connections go here, um, but we can't do very much. So what else can we do to figure out what's going on in the watch? Well, um, 
you can actually write your own software to it and start playing around. You can, um, for instance, uh, read the values of the 32 pins on the watch. Um, you know, and it's, it's just, a, they're all ones and noughts, so it's just a string of ones and zeros. You press a button and then you do it again and you see what changes. Um, and you can work out some things quite easily like this. And you basically, you've got your 32 pins and you're just ticking them off. You know, you can, if you know the buttons, then those are pins that you don't have to worry about for other things. Um, but that still doesn't get us all the way. Um, it would be much better if we could figure out what the original engineers did in their software. Um, now, the chips, the chip manufacturers have added something um, called a, a protect bit. And when, if you set that when you're uploading the firmware, it stops people using those debug connectors at the back to read out any of the firmware, which seems like a really, really sensible idea, and they've done it. Um, and at this point, you'd think that it would be impossible for us to get the original firmware out of the device. But um, that nasty bootloader strikes again. And if you look inside, um, this watch manufacturer provides a, um, an Android app to do the, the updates. The Android app's a zip file. If you look inside the zip file, you find um, a whole bunch of hex files. And these are files that contain all the, all the actual code for the watch. And the slightly worrying thing here is that these, you notice they have names like Blinky and um, Beerly App HRS. These are the exact names of examples in the, um, in the SDK provided by the chip manufacturer. So it means that the people who've, who've written the software for this watch have based their whole firmware on a example application from Nordic and haven't even bothered to rename it, which again gives you an idea of why you really want to be looking at replacing the software. Anyway, if you look inside one of these files, um, you find there's just random data, but you can see there are definitely patterns to it. Um, and if you look inside the ARM data sheet, um, you find there's this thing called a vector table. Uh, and the vector table uh, is just a load of pointers right at the beginning of memory. You've got the first one is a stack pointer, and all the rest of them point to bits of code. So you could look at this, um, look at where the code was, um, use the GCC toolchain maybe and disassemble it, um, and get a much better idea of what was going on. But there are some tools that make this really nice and easy. Um, so this is an example of, of how it decodes. Um, you've got, on these ARM chips, everything's kind of memory mapped in its own location. So right at the bottom end of memory, um, you know, at North X 000, you've got, um, you've got the actual program code. And then when it starts with two, you know that that's RAM. Um, there are tools like this, which is Gydra, if I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But um, this is actually a tool created by the NSA um, for looking into firmwares and binaries and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and it supports a whole, different, whole load of different architectures, but one of them is the ARM Cortex for these little devices. Um, so you boot this up and you get something like this. Um, you can see you've got the, the same uh, vector table here. Um, but now it's, it's noticed that these things are actually addresses that point to certain locations. And for instance, if you look at the hard fault one here, um, this is basically a seg fault. If something goes horribly wrong in your code, it will call here. And you can see it's actually not only disassembled it, but it's decompiled it, and it's figured out it was just a wild true loop. So if something bad happens, your watch just locks up. Um, so now we can kind of look in from the vector table and see where bits of code are. Um, but we can, we can also look out at bits of memory and see where peripherals are being accessed. So here you've got address um, North X5, lots of zeros. Um, you've got these I.O. ports, and these directly control where pins are. So for instance, those buttons we were looking at before, if you're interested in the button, you go for North X5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, and if you look at the, you just do a search through the code, you find it's being used, and you see the disassembly, and you see it's reading that whole number, and that whole address in memory, which is a 32-bit number for 32 pins, shifting it right by the pin number and adding one. Um, and so now you know you've got a function that accesses the GPIO. And where this is used, you can start to get a better idea about other things. Um, 
there are other peripherals like the serial port, for instance, and you know that the only thing that could possibly use a serial port on this watch is GPS. So anything using that address you now know as GPS. And you can start to build up a table of where everything goes. Um, the other interesting thing you can do is you can, um, you can find bits of text buried in the firmware. This watch says buy whenever you turn it off. So again, you know that any code that references this is code that will be shutting the watch down and turning off peripherals. Um, so you can, you can start to dig into it that way as well. Uh, so this brings me to an interesting thing about um, the, the people who did this firmware obviously just took, the, um, took a totally standard example, added a bunch of stuff to it, and shipped it. Um, they didn't actually look at what the compiler was doing. Um, so as in going through this, I noticed things like this code, I figured out it actually sends data to the LCD. It sends um, one pixel worth of data, 16 bits, and the, the LCD is wired eight bits at a time. So it just sets the, the clock pin, it, um, it writes eight bits of data, sorry, clears the clock pin, writes eight bits of data, sets it, clears it to kind of toggle it in, and then does the same thing again. The engineers were obviously trying to do something very, very smart here because they, they went to a lot of effort to actually wire this LCD in um, and address it with uh, parallel data so they could push eight bits out in a go, it, uh, right in one go, and they wired it up so that they could do it very efficiently from the microcontroller. But they obviously thought that these functions were going to be inlined or something. As it turns out, they're not. And the whole watch is running about half the speed that it could do if they'd just put one inline keyword um, uh, near these function calls so that they could, could have forced everything to, um, to get put in. And I think it's a, it shows that even if you think the compiler is doing something, it's well worth diving a little bit deeper to, um, to try and get a better idea about it. So at the end of this, um, it, it's kind of a process almost like... Um, uh, like doing a jigsaw. You, you kind of find bits around the edge and you, you build in from the edges and the corners um, and you can kind of rule certain things out. Um, and it, it, it makes it quite a fun process trying to figure out this data, which is basically the end result. Um, just a list of where all the, the pins and things go. So now we've got... Um, <coughs> Now we've got this, uh, an idea of how to actually write to the, the underlying hardware. How do you run JavaScript on something that only has 64K of RAM? Um, this is a, a graph from, um, from the, the Chrome developers blog. And so this is, I think, for the Chrome web browser itself. But you get an idea of their expected memory usage. They've made some really big changes here, trying to make a cut-down light mode for um, more constrained phones and things. But they're still using six megabytes of RAM um, you know, that's actually, uh, it's way, way too much. It's 100 times more than this, phone, this, um, this watch has. So you need to think a little bit more about what you can do to really get things down as, as far as possible. Um, seven years ago, there weren't actually very many JavaScript engines available. Now, if you look, there are a whole bunch. This is just the first three that came to mind. But there are, if you look at Wikipedia, there are probably at least 20 different JavaScript engines. Um, there are some of these that deal with very, um, very constrained embedded targets, but they pretty much all have 64K RAM as their absolute minimum, which is like the minimum you get to by, by cutting out a bunch of stuff. So you've really got to think, um, you, I, I basically, especially seven years ago, I had to do something very different. So Esprino was, um, was designed specifically to run on these kind of low-end microcontrollers. And in fact, it'll run in, in under 6K of RAM, and you can, you can write some useful code in it. I'll, I'll kind of give you a very quick example of that in a sec. Um, it's not all of ES5, but there's, there's basically everything so that if you're just writing normal code, you won't notice a difference. And in fact, generally, if you go through, um, uh, if you transpile your code, you'll find that it transpiles to a subset that runs absolutely perfectly on these. There's a list of exactly what it doesn't, doesn't support there. Um, but the real reason for, for doing something special is this. Um, if you look at kind of the vague specs of a typical computer, 
Um, these are just randomly picked out of the air and for a typical mic controller. You'll see, I mean, the computer is obviously more powerful, um, but the, it's very interesting when you look at the amount of bytes per megahertz of processing power. So very roughly, you can imagine this would be the amount of time the computer takes to go through all available memory. Um, on a PC, it's, it's way, way more, um, more memory available to it per, per computing instruction than on the microcontroller. So you really, if you don't necessarily care about outright speed, which you probably don't if you're trying to run JavaScript on a microcontroller, um, maybe you should be looking more at trying to get, um, uh, to spend more of your instructions making the most of the available memory. Um, so one of the ways you can, you can make more of the memory is to try and do something about memory fragmentation. Um, so again, not normally a problem on desktop, but on embedded targets, mostly people statically allocate everything. Um, and it's because you can't necessarily depend on malloc to always work for you. Um, so in this example, you allocate a bunch of stuff and you just deallocate odd items. Um, but that means that even though you've now got 15 memory elements free, there's no, there's no big contiguous area of storage that you can use. So in Esprino, we use, um, we use fixed size memory blocks, which they have a few benefits. Um, we can chain the blocks um, to, to, for instance, store strings when we're expecting data to come in a bit at a time to save us having to reallocate a big block each time. Um, we also save the overhead of having malloc. Um, so malloc will use at least four bytes to store the length of the data that you allocated. Um, but if you're going to do garbage collection and stuff like that, you also need to store a pointer yourself to the data that you allocated. So now you're using eight bytes, so basically half the size of this variable, just to have allocated some data. Um, the other thing is that because they're all fixed size, they're all in the same place, you can just plow through them really quickly um, if you need to do something like a garbage collection pass. Um, so the other slightly weird thing we do is um, we don't, we execute direct from the source code. We don't um, compile to a bytecode or an intermediate code. And again, one of the reasons is if you, if you want to run an interpreter on your system, you're probably doing it because you want to get a stack trace, um, because you want to be able to analyze your code and step through it and do a lot of the things that interpreters are really good at. If you then throw away all your source code, you're kind of losing a lot of the benefits of having a language interpreter in the first place. But when you look at it, um, this is an example of just some code that, that very simply draws out a Mandelbrot fractal. Um, the normal JavaScript, 300 bytes, and when you minify it, it starts to go down quite low. And then if you remove all the reserved words and you, um, you turn them into single bytes, um, it gets down really low. But the bytecode that SpiderMonkey will produce is, you know, that's almost as much as the raw JavaScript was. Um, and if you do GCC, this is minus OS, so this is telling GCC to optimize the size. Um, and it's still not managing to get any better than the, um, the, the normal JavaScript. Um, and to be fair, this, the GCC compile will go way, way faster. But um, at the end of the day, we weren't really after speed. So, um, just as a quick example of what this actually, what this looks like, um, I will, uh, let's see if I can uh, pull up, not that one, how did that go? Ah, okay. okay. So this is a, um, a picture of the memory in a JavaScript interpreter that's running with, um, with 700 bytes of RAM available. So um, I've, I've just got it running locally. Um, in red, um, each red row is an allocated row. Each um, black and blue row is a row that isn't allocated. Um, you can see individual bits in here. Um, so it's not at the byte level. You know, white or, or blue is a one. Uh, red or, or black is a zero. So if I start writing um, here, uh, let's see. You can see that as I'm typing, um, 
it's, it's filling up characters um, eight bits at a time in there. And when you reach the end of one block, it will allocate a new block. Uh, so we can do that. We can now try and split it maybe by, by a space. Um, and we'll see it, it go through, allocate a whole bunch more memory like that, and then throw it away again after it's, it's not used. So um, let's, let's write that again. If we now save it in a variable, we'll see it allocate the data and then keep that data. Um, and you can see how quickly memory gets fragmented here. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter in this case. And in fact, we can defragment this, this memory because everything's in a fixed size block and we know where all the references are. It's very easy to push everything back if we ever did need to allocate a, a big chunk of memory. Um, but doing things this way actually allows us to, um, to do quite complicated things in very, very little memory. So for instance, there's a regular expression parser in here. So um, let, let's just get rid of... Um, a for the moment, and then we'll do, um, we'll just split it again, but we'll do it on, I don't know, maybe else knows. Um, so, yeah, um, so you can see it's, it's gone through, it's, um, it's been able to, um, to run a regular expression with, with extremely low amounts of RAM. There we go. Okay. Okay, right. So, um, now we've got this running on our device, how do we actually access it? Well, um, there are no no IO pins on this other than, um, other than what you get for charging. So if you do anything, you've got to do it by the radio that's on there, which is, which is Bluetooth. And one of the really nice things that's available to us now is something called Web Bluetooth, which is um, something that uh, Google introduced in, uh, in the Chromium browser, and it's worked its way now into Edge and Opera, um, which means that it's available as long as you, you've got one of those browsers, um, which a vast amount of the population does. Uh, Windows 10, Mac OS, Chromebook, Android, um, even Linux and Raspberry Pi, you can access Bluetooth devices directly from a web browser. Um, and this makes your life really, really easy. Um, so there's a... Um, iOS, unfortunately, doesn't support it out of the box because Apple not only don't support it in Safari, but they stop you from installing your own, um, your own actual browser engine. So even though you can install Chrome on Safari, so Chrome on iOS, you are still using what's basically Safari's browser under the hood. Um, there is an app called WebBLE, which, um, which does manage to work around this and allows you to, um, to view websites and let them access Web Bluetooth if you need that. Um, and that's open source. So if you were developing a project where you needed to access Bluetooth on a bunch of devices, you could, um, you could fork it, you could add your own code to it, and then you could, you could ship that as a wrapper. And again, it, it works on Node, and the JavaScript interpreter itself that runs on the watch will execute web Bluetooth code. So um, you can now, uh, you can now uh, make tools like this that will allow you to, to write code to the device. In reality, you don't need very much. You just need a serial terminal um, that will run on whatever computer you're doing and will communicate over Bluetooth low energy. But, to actually make your life easier as a developer, it's nice to have syntax highlighting and code completion, the ability to pull in modules and stuff like that. And that can all be done online, which, um, which especially for the project, makes life really, really easy in terms of shipping updates, making sure everyone's all in the same version and stuff like that. Um, I should add that this is also a progressive web app, so you can still use it, even though it's a website, you can still use it completely offline. Um, to, to access things. Uh, in the same way, we've got a, um, an app that allows you to, um, to load whatever new applications you want on. And this is basically um, just the whole thing is, is hosted on GitHub. Uh, you can make pull requests with new applications in order to add what you want. And the great thing about this is that 
none of this stuff is dependent on a, uh, on a server. E even the IDE is all free and open. So regardless of what happens, you are still able to use these devices yourself. Um, at the end of the day, the code is a very simple example. Um, this is a device, say an app, that will tell you what your current speed is. Um, and you can see the vast majority of the code here is actually accessing G, which is a graphics instance, to just draw the code in, say, to draw the data in the way that you want it. Um, you can come up with applications very easy that do some quite interesting things without having to do a bunch of work. If you don't have a, a watch available, um, actually, just to add, you only need um, to add a small amount of boilerplate to this, and then you can do a PR to that GitHub repository, and you can make it so that everyone can use it. Um, because the, um, the JavaScript interpreter is, is reasonably compact and can be made to run in a, in a fixed area of memory, like 64K, um, we can actually compile it with Imscripten. So um, this is something that's available now. If you don't have a Bangle.js and want to play around, obviously none of the sensors work in there, but you can still develop applications um, and run them completely in the web browser with an emulator that's executing um, your JavaScript code, not in the, well, it's executing it in the browser, but it's executing it in a JavaScript interpreter in the browser. So if you want to see exactly how capable the JavaScript interpreter on one of these devices is without getting one, you can, you can try it out um, at a very low level. So yeah, these things are, um, in an ideal world, they would have been shipped by now, um, but because of coronavirus, there's been a bit of a delay. Um, I'm actually going to be seeing them probably beginning of next week. They're being shipped this week, um, and then they're going out to people, people next week. Um, so they'll actually be properly available um, in March. However, this whole um, Bangle.js is based on Esprino, which is a, it's an open source interpreter. Um, and as such, it's available for a whole bunch of different devices. Um, the work on it is supported by, by sales of boards that, um, that we've developed that run it, but because it's open, it's available on a whole bunch of, um, of very cheap hardware. So you can go on eBay, you can buy a ESP8266 or ESP32 dev board for about four pounds delivered, um, and then you can, you can start to play around with real hardware. So. Um, that's the end of the talk. I've got about 20 minutes left, have I? Yeah, well, the, um, you, you did say you I might do a little demo. demo? Yeah, yeah, will we do a demo? Let's go for it. Okay, let's see if this works then. Right, so I'm just going to try and unmirror the screen so I'm not having to give myself a massive prick in the neck. Um, Okay, we're good. Let's make the text a little bit bigger. Okay, so we'll see if this works. Well, we'll ignore the fact that there's, there's no live view, um, and we'll connect to, um, to this device. <sighs> okay, now it's picked it up. Okay, good. So hopefully, um, let's see if I can do something here force the screen to go on for a sec. Okay, so now we're actually, um, we're communicating with our device completely wirelessly. Um, there's the clock application on here, which at the moment I've just reset it, so it's, um, it's come up as completely wrong time. Um, we can 
we have the REPL on the left-hand side, where you're actually communicating directly with the JavaScript interpreter on the watch. And we have, um, on the right-hand side, just somewhere you can, you can write code and easily upload it. So for now, I'm just going to, um, to erase any of the currently running code on the watch. Um, and so that we can see it, I'll just make sure I force the, um, uh, the LCD to be, um, to be on. <laughs> okay, so um, obviously we can, we can uh, maybe write text to the, the console. And it will appear there in a very small font. Um, when you turn on development mode, you can actually make it so that if your code does create any errors, it will still show them with effectively a full stack trace um, on the device. So when you're using it, you at least have some idea that, that something might have gone wrong. Um, so I guess let's just come up with a very simple account down timer. Um, so we have here some example code, which will just flash um, a little, little sort of fake LED there. Um, but it's, it's easy enough to take this and, um, and turn it into a countdown. So let's uh, And now we can look at trying to draw it onto the screen. Uh, so we'll clear the screen. Um, now we'll draw the count and we'll do it. Um, we'll set it to go right in the middle. And so that I can um, update this function on the fly without resetting, I'm just going to take it into a named function outside. Um, OK, so let's upload that. We should now start to see our text appearing very slowly. But we can now start to experiment with it. Um, we can change the font size, for instance. So if I do, um, if I want to change the font to be effective font, um, and let's, uh, let's just, because we've reset it again, let's force the screen to always be on again. Okay, so now the screen's forced to be on. We can do that, and next time it updates, it will make the font a bit bigger. And now obviously it's not aligned properly, so we can just change the font alignment. Um, so if that's good, we can move this into the actual code that we're using now we've got it right. And maybe when it actually reaches zero, um, we want to do something. So um, uh, okay, let, let's create a new function for alarm. So we can test this by, um, by just typing alarm to try and run the function. And hopefully, which you can hardly see, but um, it's now vibrating once a second. Um, let's re-upload this. And just, oh yeah, OK. And let's, let's actually put a message to show that it's actually um, got the alarm, uh, which we can do with. Um, 
there are a few functions built in um, which allow you to show messages and things. So for instance, we can do show message. Um, which it gets overwritten very quickly at that point by the, um, by the countdown. If I stick that in there. And so that we can actually, um, we don't have to wait around just for a minute and a half for this to work, I'll set the countdown to, to five. And hopefully now, if, if I haven't done anything horribly wrong, yep, there you go, it's cancelled timer, it's done a little alarm. But you know, that's just a few minutes of, of work. Um, and you can now take this, you can, um, you can do a pull request with it, and everyone else can have the fun of a 100-second of a timer that you can only cancel by, by resetting the watch. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's, that's what it's like. Um, again, this software is entirely open, so it can run on a whole bunch of different devices. Um, to the point where there's even um, a firmware build available that will run all of the code, effectively the same um, code that's on this watch, but on a uh, cheap Chinese fitness band that I think costs about seven pounds delivered. Um, so you can actually, you can still play around with this with, um, with very little investment. Um, but do we have time for questions or are we? Thank you, that is completely awesome. Um, we have time, I think, do we? Do we have time for? We have time for two, two or three minutes. I, I'd, I'd like to start just by um, going straight with Kill and asking, <coughs> why JavaScript? Why not Lua? <laughs> why not something else? Um, because it's, you know, love it or hate it, it's, it's, it's quite a popular language. Um, and it's quite forgiving as well. Um, you know, if you imagine if every, every web page was written, written in C, what a nightmare the internet would be. Um, it, it's not great, but it's, it's kind of got where it is because it works. Um, and for doing, you know, there, there's a real question about whether you should write uh, a million lined enterprise application using JavaScript. And I think, you know, you can have some very heated arguments about that. If you're doing like a page of code like this, um, really there's, there are no real downsides to to yeah, that. It's, and just, it, it's just super fun, yeah. right? And it looks a bit like C and PHP, and you can, without very little, little knowledge of it, you can get started very quickly. Awesome. Yeah, so. Let's. If, do we have any questions? Yeah. I've got, um, so, how does the battery life on the custom firmware um, compare to the base firmware? It's actually um, it's remarkably similar. Um, so the biggest issue right now is. Um, when the CPU is working flat out, it draws, I think it's about four or five milliamps. Um, but you, if you turn the screen on, it draws about 40. Uh, if you turn the GPS on, that draws like another 30, 40. Um, so actually the biggest change to how, the, how long the watch lasts in everyday use is, is the, the thing you use to, to turn it on like that, because you don't want it coming in automatically in your pocket. Um, so depending the settings you have set to that, it depends whether it's more or less battery life than you, you would be getting. But at least it gives you the flexibility to choose. You're not stuck with some rubbish way of, of turning it on that's always coming in your pocket. Okay. Um, so the application page that you showed with all the applications that you can download, mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, are there any security mechanisms or any other mechanisms for controlling misbehaving applications? Or have you seen anything like that before? Uh, no. So, um, so at the moment, it's still at the state where we've got, um, there are about 500 of them out there with people using them. Um, so it's not really at the point where people are, are uploading stuff that would, would misbehave. I think it's, um, the, the question is, is what, um, what someone might do to it. They're very unlikely to be able to actually destroy the hardware of your watch. Um, what they could do is have a Bluetooth keyboard application that um, randomly typed a, a bunch of characters that you know, backdoored your PC whenever you connected it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very difficult to, to work around that. The, the real bonus, though, is that the code is just up there 
on GitHub for anyone to see. If anyone thinks there's anything fishy going on at all, you know, they can just take a quick look and it should be quite obvious if, if any, any app is trying to do something dodgy. Um, for, for general everyday um, problems, we've got a little script that runs over it. Um, so every commit on Travis just does a sanity check to make sure that no one's done something, done something stupid. Um, and if, if there are things that we know could be potential problems, um, then we can add screening for them. Um, and then even before it gets merged, we should, we should know if there was an issue. I think we have time for one more. Did I see, what, was there one more? No, I think, no, okay. Go. Uh, can you reuse other people's code and write libraries or maybe even this thing that you just wrote? Can yeah. I use it in my software? And how does it look like? Is it require, import, something? Okay. Um, so, yeah, you can, um, the IDE allows you to, to require stuff. Um, we did for a while have some NPM support built in, but um, unfortunately, because when you require one thing, it tends to require another bunch of stuff. Um, it was it was super hard work. It was like 1% of packages that you could actually use on this device because otherwise they just fill your, fill your RAM up um, with complete garbage. You can, um, because this is running in the web browser, you can just require a URL so you can, um, in a really hacky way, you can require a gist um, or you can, you can require the file that's sitting um, on someone else's is server as long as it's got the cross origin um, turned off on it. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I suppose a good example is like the GPS. There's a lot of code out there for handling GPS coordinates for online mapping. Um, so if you want to turn the uh, latitude and longitude into some random mapping coordinate, you, you really can just find a bunch, bit of code on the internet, either reference it directly or, or just, just include it in the thing. Um, so the, you know, the, the JavaScript it supports is, is at a level where you're unlikely to have any any issues at all um, pulling in someone else's code. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gordon. That was, uh, that was really, really cool. Uh, thank you very much.